All right, so on our last mission, we worked on getting our CubeSat to talk to us using a particular part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can pick up using our eyes, called visible light, so using our LED here. For this mission, we are going to pick up right where that mission left off, but instead, we're going to be making sure that not only can our CubeSat talk to us, but we can talk to our CubeSat. We can give it commands and tell it what to do. So if we're thinking of real life space missions, this is a little bit like Telstar 1, which was the first functional communication satellite. So not only could it beam signals down to Earth, but importantly, it could also receive signals from Earth. And that was what it beamed back. So whatever it got, it sent back down. And it used that to transmit uh, TV and telephone signals between the United States and the United Kingdom. For something a little bit more recent, it's also a bit like one of my favorite CubeSat projects out there, which is called MemeSat, uh, which is a satellite that has been filled up with memes and you can beam your own memes up to it uh, and also beam up a request to have it send a meme back down to you. So as I said, we're gonna be picking up where our last mission left off. We're gonna be using our LED to send our signals back to us. For this mission, we're gonna be adding one brand new piece of hardware and it's something pretty cool uh, to talk to our CubeSat. We're gonna be using a button. So for our mission today, we're gonna to send our CubeSat a command using our button, and we're gonna get it to send some information back to us. And the information we're gonna get it to send is how many times our button has been pushed. There are plenty of other things we could get it to do as well, but this is just enough diagnostic information to let us know that our command has been received. So in terms of how we connect our button up, we've actually got two options. So either way, we're gonna to wanna to connect one leg of our button to one of the free pins on our microcontroller and I'm just gonna pop it into this one here. So the next one up from our LED, that will be pin one. So our LED is on pin zero. Uh, and with this one, we can either connect this to our power so that when we push our button down, our pin goes what we call high, so it gets five volts, or we can connect it to the ground so that when we push our button down and connect our circuit, our pin goes to zero volts or low. So for this project, to make things a little bit easier, we're gonna connect it to the ground. So this row here. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is because if we're gonna connect it to power, we need to add a resistor to our circuit. But if we're connecting it to the ground, we can actually use the resistor that's built into the microcontroller called a pull-up resistor. So this just saves us having to add an extra component to our circuit. But either way, will work equally well. So that's it in terms of connecting stuff electrically, uh, but we do also need to change the code on our microcontroller. So to do that, we're just gonna pop our microcontroller out and stick our microcontroller back into the programmer to put some fresh code on it. All right, so just like last time, we are starting with a blank Arduino sketch. And the first thing we're gonna do is set some variables. So we're gonna start just like last time by setting our blink pin as an int. And we're gonna use the same pin as last time, that's pin zero. And this time we're also gonna set a button pin. Uh, and we've connected that to the next one up on our microcontroller, which is pin one. So while we're up the top here, we're also gonna set a couple more variables. Anything we put up the top here is a global variable. That means we can access it no matter what part of our program we're in. And that means we can use it to pass information between different functions, different parts of our program, which we're going to need to do in a bit. First one we're gonna set is our button counter and set that to zero to start with. And the second one we're gonna set is a different type of variable called a Boolean or a bool. Uh, and that is just a true or false value. So either yes or no, uh, that's gonna be whether or not our button is currently pressed or has been detected as being pressed. So we're gonna call that button pressed. And we're gonna start that as false. So our button is gonna start as not pressed, which kind of makes sense. So again, just like last time, we have two main parts to our code, which are blank and ready for us to fill in. The first one is our setup, which runs once when our microcontroller boots up. And the second is our loop, which runs over and over again until our microcontroller switches off. So in our setup code, the first thing we're going to do is set, just like before, our pin modes for our blink pin. And we're gonna set that to output. And because we've got another pin now for our button, we're gonna set pin mode 
on our button pin to input. And because we've decided to connect it to ground and we want that pin to be high until we connect it to ground and it goes low, we're gonna tell our microcontroller to use that built-in pull-up resistor so we don't need to add one to our breadboard. And to do that, we're just gonna add an underscore pull up to the end of our pin mode. So next we're gonna jump into our loop and tell our microcontroller what it should do if our button is pressed. And to do that, we're gonna start with an if statement. So we're gonna start by going if our button is pressed. So that's referring back to that variable that we set at the top of our file. So if our button is pressed, what do we want to do? All I want our microcontroller to do is count how many times our button has been pressed and blink that number back to us. So to do that, I'm gonna use a piece of code called a for loop, and that's exactly what it sounds like. For each time we've pressed our button, it's going to execute the code inside this loop. I'm gonna start with the word for and a variable to keep track of how many times we've blinked so far. I'm gonna call that x and it started at zero. Then we're gonna give our code its condition. So it's gonna keep doing this until this condition is satisfied. So as long as x is less than our button count, we wanna keep going. Uh, and as soon as x is the same as our button count, our loop is gonna stop. And then at the end of each loop, so that we keep track of how many times we've done it, we're going to make x bigger by one. And the shortcut to do that is x plus plus. We could also write x equals x plus one, um, but x plus plus is a little bit shorter. So we're gonna add our curly brackets again, and then anything we put inside these will get run however many times our button has been pushed. Uh, and that's basically gonna be the same code from our Blink demo. So we're going to digital write our Blink pin wait for say 200 milliseconds. Digital write our Blink pin to low and wait another 200 milliseconds. And then the last thing we're gonna do is because our button pressed is currently set to true and we will get to how we set it to true in a second, we're gonna just switch our button pressed variable to false. And that's so that we're not just doing this all the time over and over again, we're only doing it when our button is pressed. So you can think of this a little bit like those uh, joke boxes where whenever you turn the switch on, uh, the little finger reaches out and turns the switch off again. That's basically what we're doing here. Whenever our button pressed code is executed, the final thing we want it to do is turn that button pressed variable back to off so that we can turn it back on again when we want it to run again. So to make sure we don't miss our button press, we're gonna be using something called an interrupt. So that is a piece of code that no matter where our program is up to, uh, if our microcontroller detects a particular trigger, it's gonna stop what it's doing, drop everything, and run this code, and then pick right back up where it left off. So interrupts are really useful for things you wanna handle straight away and things that you never want to miss. So our spacecraft here only has one mission, and that's to uh, count how many times that button is pressed. So we definitely don't wanna miss that. But if you're building a real spacecraft, that might be a message from the ground. And if you are building a payload, that might be a signal from the spacecraft bus to say, hey, send me your data, it's time to send it back to the ground. So to use our interrupt, the first thing we've got to do is tell our microcontroller that we'd like to use one. And to do that, we're gonna jump back up into our setup and we're gonna add a couple of little lines of code that look kind of like gibberish, uh, but what they're doing is diving deep into our microcontroller's guts and turning some switches on and off. So the first one is G-I-M-S-K, and then there's a weird little bar symbol equals, uh, and then bit P-C-I-E, close our bracket, and semicolon on the end, and that's telling our microcontroller that we wanna use something called a pin change interrupt. That means it's looking for signals on our pins, like our button, and it's looking for any change on those pins. So whether those pins go from being off to on or go from being on to off, either of those changes will trigger the code inside our interrupt. So the second thing we've gotta do is tell it which pin we want it to look at. So our button 
is connected to pin one. So we're gonna go PCMSK, and this is really just a lot of gibberish. Bar equals bit again, and we're gonna set PCINT one. So the trigger for our interrupt code doesn't have to be a change of voltage on a pin. It could be a timer, it could be a sensor. There are all kinds of things inside our chip that can trigger our interrupt. Uh, and the best place to go to find more about those is our chip's data sheet. So we've told our microcontroller that we want to use interrupts and which pin it should be listening on. The last thing we need to do is to tell it what to do if it detects that trigger. So to do that, We've got one more little bit of code to write. That one is outside our setup function and also outside our loop function. It's kind of off in its own little world. And we're gonna set it up like this. We're gonna start by typing ISR, so that's interrupt service routine. Uh, and then some more gibberish PCINT zero, so that's PC interrupt zero. Uh, we're looking for pin change interrupts. And that has it vect on the end of it going to open up our brackets here and pop the code that we want to trigger in. So remember, this is detecting any change on our pin. So it's not just going to detect when our button goes down, it's also going to detect when it comes up again. It doesn't just detect when that part of our circuit is connected, it also detects when it's disconnected. So we probably only want to count one of those, either the up or the down of our button. So each time we run our interrupt, the first thing we want to check is, has our button been opened or closed? It doesn't really matter which of those we look for, as long as we're only looking for one of them, because otherwise we're going to accidentally count twice as many button presses as we've actually done. So just to make things simple, I'm going to say that we're going to detect when our button is closed. That's when our button is pushed down. And we're going to do that by typing if, and then we're going to do a digital read, which is like a digital write, but backwards. Instead of telling our microcontroller to turn a pin on or off, we're going to detect whether that pin is on or off. Curly brackets again. And then when our button is pressed, we're going to do two things. Uh, and it's all to do with these variables that we set up the top here. So the first thing we're going to do is set our button count to increase by one. And we're going to use the same plus plus shortcut that we used before. So that's gonna increase that number by one. And the second thing we're gonna do is to trigger the code in our main loop here by setting button pressed to true. So a really quick run through of what our code is gonna do. We're gonna set up our pins up here and tell our microcontroller that it's gonna be a listening for an interrupt on pin one. Then we're gonna jump straight into our loop and go round and round and round and round in here. Most of the time our button pressed variable is going to be false. So we're just gonna skip straight back to the start of our loop. But if our button does get pressed, our interrupt code will trigger, our variable will go up by one and our button pressed will be set to true. Then we'll jump straight back into wherever we left off in our loop. Our loop will see the button pressed is now true it will blink the right number of times and then turn button pressed back to false, ready to be set back to true again next time our interrupt is triggered. So there's two questions you might have. The first one is why not just put our button detection into our main loop like this? And the reason we're not doing that is that while our microcontroller is waiting, like with these delays, uh, it could actually miss our button press. Whereas if we use an interrupt, we know that it's always listening for it. And the other question you might have is why not just put all of this code to blink our LED in our interrupt and just trigger that each time our interrupt does. Now the reason that won't work is because of the way our interrupt works. So interrupts jump in and tell the controller to drop everything and do this first. And that includes keeping track of time. So you could try putting our for loop into our interrupt, but it's just gonna give you all the blinks at once because it can't actually pause because while we're in interrupt land, we can't actually keep track of time. Everything else on the microcontroller is stopped to handle this code. So we wanna keep this code nice and simple and super quick uh, and do all of our waiting in our main loop. So let's upload our code to our microcontroller. All right, so let's drop our microcontroller back into our circuit, connect up our battery. And just for a little bit of fun, I'm going to uh, reconnect our button just stuck through 
our patch antenna on the top here. So we've got one antenna for transmitting and one antenna for receiving. Not 100% accurate, but a little bit more fun than just having it dangling there. And close our CubeSat up again. Once again, fitting it all in the box is the hardest part of working on a CubeSat. All right, and now our test, our moment of truth. We're gonna push our button. One blink, push it again. Two blinks, three blinks, four blinks, yes! It's the simplest thing in the world. We taught our satellite to count. But that means that not only is our satellite communicating with us, we're also able to send commands to our satellite, to our payload as well. So if you want a little bit of a challenge, there's a couple of things you can try. First of all, maybe try getting it to blink a particular message, maybe in Morse code, uh, instead of just keeping count. Maybe try getting it to blink a random number, and then we can use our uh, six-sided CubeSat as a six-sided dice. Or if you want something extra challenging, see if you can figure out how to wire up a second button to reset the counter back to zero. Because right now the only way to do that is to open it up and disconnect our battery. But I reckon you can figure out a way uh, to do that without having to open our CubeSat back up again. So I will leave those challenges for you to try and figure out on your own, and I will catch you for our next paper CubeSat mission.